Okay. Um, we covered some quite difficult concepts in the last lecture. And you can see, I was just going to say we've lost some people, but they have just turned up. Okay. Uh, we covered some quite difficult concepts in the last lecture, uh, but the theory that I explained to you is very beautiful because it allows you to calculate absolutely everything about the crystallography of martensite. So, if we start with a crystal of austenite and we observe the change in shape when you get martensite, then it looks like a shear on this plane. And that is exactly what we observe when we look at the displacements due to martensite. Okay. However, a shear cannot change the structure of austenite into that of martensite. You must have two shears, which is equivalent to an invariant line strain. That means it leaves the line common to these two planes unchanged and unrotated. So we've got to add another shear here, but that gives us the wrong shape. It gives us the right crystal structure but the wrong shape. Now, in order to get the correct shape, we've got to use a deformation which does not change the crystal structure, but corrects the shape. And the kinds of deformation which do not change the crystal structure are slip, in which the Burgers vector is a lattice vector, and twinning. Twinning simply reorients the lattice. So, on average, this shape is exactly the same as this on a macroscopic scale. But on a microscopic scale, this plane is not a flat plane. It consists of crystallographic facets, and therefore, this plane is irrational. Okay? Uh, it, it doesn't have rational indices. And the theory predicted before the observations that you should be able to see transformation twins inside plates of martensite, and when electron microscopy came in. The first observation was made using carbon replicas which showed lines inside the margin site. But of course you can't do crystallography with carbon replicas. So that those observations by, uh, were in Japan by Shimitsu and Nishiyama. And then transmission electron microscopy using thin foils became possible. And therefore it was, uh, it was, we were able to show exactly that these are twins. Alternatively, if you have a sufficiently high resolution, you should be able to see the slip steps in the transmission electron microscope. So absolutely everything about the crystallography of martensite, the reason why it is a thin, the reason why it is a thin plate, and uh, the thin plate with sharp ends, the amount of shear, the amount of volume change, absolutely everything is predictable given the lattice parameters of the parent and the front phases. And this theory is completely general. It doesn't just apply to steels, but to any kind of martensitic transformation, whether it's in shape memory metals or in solid solutions of ga uh, what are normally gases, argon, oxygen, etc., etc. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's a very good uh, question. Um, now, I explained to you in the last lecture that twinning occurs when the velocity is very high because uh, twin boundaries can move much more rapidly than dislocation boundaries. Okay? So, supposing that martensite plate forms at a very high velocity, then there's an enthalpy change of transformation which heats up the material. Yeah? You know, it's an effect called recalescence where the transformation happens so fast that you create heat which can't be dissipated quickly. So if the plate gets hot, then it slows down. And then you get slip. So in the literature, you will find micrographs of iron-nickel martensite, iron-nickel-carbon martensite, which is twin in the center but dislocated on the peripheries. Yeah. Okay, so the crystallography is not the only thing that we need. Of course, we need it if we want to predict, for example, texture. Yeah. When, you, when you make your observations using electron backscattered diffraction or X-ray diffraction, etc., to look at the texture, then you need to calculate crystallography, and this is how you do it. 
And later on, uh, when we come to do trip steels, I will show you how applying a stress biases the structure. That means you don't form all possible martensite, but only that martensite which complies with the stress, and therefore the texture changes. Okay? But we need much more than that. We need to be able to calculate the thermodynamics of martensite. In other words, if I add gold to steel, how will the martensite start temperature change? Right? You need to know that. Okay. So, today I'm going to finish off martensite by talking about the thermodynamics. And you are all familiar with free energy curves, are you? Okay. So, here we have the free energy curve of ferrite and then we have the free energy curve of austenite at a constant temperature T1. Right? Obviously, those curves will change if I alter the temperature. Now, to find equilibrium, what do I do? To find the equilibrium compositions of austenite and ferrite, what do I do? We draw a tangent which is common to both of these curves. That means it touches this curve and this curve at these points. And that gives me the equilibrium composition of austenite and the equilibrium composition of ferrite. Now, why, why do we use this common tangent? Right. Um, there's a, a slightly different answer. You are absolutely right that that gives us the minimum free energy of a mixture of austenite and ferrite at that temperature. Uh, but why does it give us the minimum free energy? Well, think about it like this. You've got ferrite, which has a low carbon concentration. You've got austenite, which has a high carbon concentration. And they are in contact, right? Why don't we get diffusion of carbon from austenite to ferrite? Because the concentration is much higher here. Right, but your diffusion equation tells you that flux is equal to diffusion coefficient times the gradient of concentration. So the concentration is not the same. Okay, excellent. So Fix's law of diffusion says that diffusion occurs down a concentration gradient, but strictly speaking, we should say it occurs down a free energy gradient. So even though the carbon in austenite has a higher free energy, uh, has a higher concentration, the free energy of carbon atoms in austenite is the same as the free energy of carbon atoms in ferrite. So we say the chemical potential of carbon in austenite is the same. So there's no tendency for diffusion. Okay. So diffusion is driven by free energy gradients. Okay, so if I now plot these points as a function of temperature, then I get my equilibrium phase boundary between ferrite, mixture of ferrite and austenite and austenite. This is the A1 phase boundary, yeah, which is a part of the iron carbon phase diagram. And if I plot this as a function of temperature, then I get the A3 phase boundary. You are familiar with this? Yeah. Now, what is not plotted on the equilibrium phase diagram is this particular line here, which I'll call T0. And this is a very, very important line even for the Bainite reaction and other reactions that we are going to do later. So you need to understand it. Okay? Uh, the T0 line is obtained from this point here, where austenite and ferrite of the same composition have the same free energy. Okay? So they have the same chemical composition because, look, they are on the same horizontal points and they have the same free energy because the same vertical position, right? Now, what does that mean? It means that if I have austenite of this composition here and I transform it into ferrite of the same composition, I get an increase in free energy. That is, you know, in Korea you use this symbol to say that cannot happen. Right? Because you are increasing the free energy, so it cannot spontaneously happen. On the other hand, if I have austenite of this composition, 
and I transform it to ferrite of the same composition, there is a reduction in free energy. So it is possible. Yeah? So if I plot the locus of these points here, I get the T0 curve. On the left-hand side, diffusion-less transformation is possible. If the austenite has a composition on the left-hand side of this curve, then diffusion-less transformation is possible. But if austenite has this composition, it's impossible for it to transform without a change in composition. Okay? So it defines the thermodynamic limit beyond which diffusion-less transformation cannot happen. So martensite must form below the T0 temperature. It cannot form above the T0 temperature because there would be an increase in free energy. Here, if I take this austenite, transform it into ferrite of the same composition, there will be an increase in free energy. Okay? Uh, so, we, we are getting to that. We've just defined the thermodynamic condition, but do you think there are other complications? that we need to take account of. So we've said, okay, a change which, which does not involve a change in composition is possible below T0. But are there other factors we need to take into account? Which, uh, you know, you, you've already said that martensite is a non-equilibrium transformation, right? And it's not equilibrium, first of all, because its composition is the same as that of the austenite. But are there any other factors which are non-equilibrium? So do you remember the beautiful Nomaski interference micrograph? What did that show? Yeah. But what, what did it represent? Displacements, right? And what do displacements cause when they are surrounded by many other crystals? Strain energy. So, T0 is not sufficient to predict the Martin size star temperature. We also have to allow for things like strain energy. And I'll come to that shortly. Okay? Right. So, you know, as long as that noise happens when I'm not speaking, it's okay. Yeah? So, Imagine that we have an alloy with that carbon concentration, X bar, and we start with austenite. And it decomposes into an equilibrium mixture of ferrite and austenite. Then that is a reduction in free energy. Okay? Because this is the composition of the ferrite, this is the composition of the austenite, and this is a mixture of that much ferrite divided by this length and that much austenite divided by this length here. Yeah. What's that called? Lever rule, yeah. Uh, so, the reduction in free energy is that. Now, earlier you said that um, this gives the minimum free energy condition. And that's, that's correct, because look, if I have this and this, then the reduction in free energy is smaller. Right? Or if I have a mixture of this ferrite and this austenite, then this arrow is shorter. Okay. So this gives you the maximum reduction in free energy, and therefore it gives you the equilibrium compositions. So we've got to draw a diagram like this uh, for diffusionless transformation. So here is the corresponding curve when there is no change in composition. So I've gone from austenite of that composition to ferrite of the same composition. So you can see that the driving force is smaller than what we had before. Okay. So that represents non-equilibrium. The composition really wants to be different, but it's forced to be identical to the austenite because diffusion does not happen during this transformation. Okay. So if you like, the carbon is trapped inside the martensite. And the thermodynamic definition of trapping is that its chemical potential increases on transfer into the martensite. It doesn't want to be there, you know, but it's forced to be in there because the interface moves very rapidly compared with diffusion. Okay? Right, so the driving force is smaller. But 
this zero is just a thermodynamic condition. Yeah. Below T0, you could get diffusional transformation, but you... you no, T0 simply defines the composition above which it's impossible to get diffusionless transformation. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's got nothing to do with diffusion. It's pure thermodynamics. There is no time involved in this. It simply defines the boundary beyond which diffusionless transformation is impossible. But both diffusional and displacive transformation can happen below T0. And diffusional transformation can happen at any temperature below A3. Yeah. Whether or not diffusion happens or displacements happen below T0 depends on time scales. So if there isn't enough time for diffusion, then you'll get displacement transformation. Yeah. And generally speaking, for all steels, for all steels, diffusion becomes difficult below 600 degrees centigrade. Okay. Not diffusion of carbon, but of iron atoms. Okay. Right, so we have a smaller uh, driving force. And then we have to account for other non-equilibrium effects. And I mentioned, uh, I mentioned to you that displacive transformations are dominated by strain energy. Okay. And dominated means it's a huge term because the shear strain is large. You know, we, we said an elastic strain is 0 0.001, whereas the shear strain here is about 0 0.26. So that's huge by comparison. So that occupies a very large term. So you need to cool below T0 till the driving force is 600 joules more okay, before you get minus that. Uh, and this, uh, this is uh, calculated from that equation that we partly derived, that the strain energy per unit volume is equal to the shear modulus times S squared plus delta squared times the thickness over length ratio. Then we have a, if your Martin site is twinned, there is a cost in creating the twin interfaces. Okay. Twin interfaces have an energy, which is about 0 0.2 joules per meter squared. Okay. Uh, so, given that the twins are very finely spaced, that's quite a significant term here, yeah. 100 joules per mole. The interface between austenite and martensite doesn't matter too much when we are talking about a grown plate because the surface to volume ratio is very small. Okay, so it's a, it's a small term. But then you also find dislocations, don't you, inside the martensite. Those are defects. Those defects you don't find in the case of ferrite or perlite. You find very few. So you need to account also for the stored energy due to defects. So you add all these terms up, and it's, it's approximately 700 joules per mole, right? So we need to undercool below T0 until the driving force chemical free energy change becomes at least 700 joules per mole. No, 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 no. Uh, all that is included in the crystallography of mitocyte but it's high because the spacing is very fine, so the amount of twin interface per unit volume is large. Yeah. So you're talking about spacing of about 200 angstroms, which means that there will be a lot of twin interface inside the martensite plate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what we do is we raise the free energy curve of martensite relative to that of ferrite by the stored energy term here, which is about 700 joules per mole. Yeah. So originally I was talking about ferrite and austenite, and when I transform from austenite to ferrite of the same composition, this is the change in free energy. But in fact, it's smaller because you have stored energy inside your martensite in the form of strain and in the form of uh, twin interfaces dislocations, etc. 
So the net free energy change is that. And that's what distinguishes martensite from ferrite of the same composition. Right. Um, now, uh, how does, uh, you know, if you go to my website, you can download a computer program which will calculate martensite start temperature as a function of many different alloying elements. And it's based on thermodynamics. And you can download an app on here to do it on your phone. When you're lying in bed, you can calculate the martensite start temperature. Okay? Um, how do we do that? All right? So here is a plot of free energy versus temperature. And this is the chemical free energy change when austenite transforms into ferrite of the same chemical composition. Here, you know, the only difference is I'm plotting against temperature. When I plot against carbon, I get those curves, right? But now I'm taking the value from the previous graph. I'm taking this value here, okay? And plot it as a function of temperature. So, this corresponds to the case where austenite and ferrite have the same free energy and the same composition. And this is the driving force available at another temperature. So, if we say that martensite forms when the magnitude of this driving force reaches a critical value, then we can calculate the MS temperature. And here is the same, uh, this, this being plotted as function of temperature, zero would be here. When the driving force reaches a critical value, we get martensite start temperature. And that critical value accounts for all the stored energy terms. And if there's some cost of nucleating, you include that in there. So all you need is a method of calculating the free energy. And then if I said to you, okay, add plutonium to steel and work out how that will change the martensite start temperature, you can do it. So how would you calculate this? Sorry? Yeah, but what, where, where can you find the data and so forth? Yeah, which one? Yes, software, yes, but which one? Yeah, so thermocalc and empty data, for example, or uh, matcalc, yeah? Those are calculation methods, but they need something else. They are simply computer programs. They don't have any data in. So what, what else do you need? Uh, when you use thermocalc, you're not using just the program databases, yeah? So, for many, many, many decades, uh, many scientists have been collecting thermodynamic data. When I was a student, we would measure a phase diagram. Okay? Just imagine how difficult that is, right? To measure a phase diagram. All that kind of work has led to enormous, very careful databases. So, you can buy the database, yeah? And you can calculate the free energy of austenite as a function of many elements, and the free energy of ferrite as a function of many elements. And therefore, this is nowadays easy to do. Okay. So you calculate this curve, you work out the critical value of the free energy needed to trigger martensite, and you have your MS temperature. Okay. So that completes the story about martensite. There's nothing more almost, to learn about martensite. You've done the crystallography, you've done the thermodynamics. Okay? We'll come to the effect of stress and strain and so forth when we do uh, the trip steels and other aspects. Okay? So I'm going to start on bainite now. And I hope to answer your question about what is the difference between bainite and martensite and so forth.
Okay, so once again we start with uh, the basic crystal structures here, which is uh, ferrite and austenite. And just as we did with martensite, I'm going to summarize what we know from observations about bainite. Okay. And then whatever theory you have has to be able to explain those observations. Okay, so um, just to repeat the difference between displacive and what we call reconstructive or diffusional transformations. Supposing I have a material here which has two different kinds of atoms, the square and the circles. Right. And they are arranged in a particular pattern which is defined by this unit cell. And I transform it by a displacive mechanism. Now, displacive mechanism means I change the crystal structure to this shape, and therefore the macroscopic shape also changes. Right. Because you can see that the near neighbors of all the atoms are exactly identical. And the concentration here is exactly the same as the concentration here of the square atoms. And the consequence is that if this transformation is happening in a constrained environment, there will be a lot of strain energy. And that means that it will tend to form a thin plate here because the displacements are small if the plate is thin, whereas they are large if the plate gets fatter. Okay. Furthermore, I know that this particular atom in the displaced object came exactly from this atom in the parent. So there is a one-to-one -one atomic correspondence. We know exactly where the atom came from. So if I reverse the transmission, I recover what I had as the parent phase. And this is the basis of the shape memory effect. You cannot get a shape memory effect with a diffusional transformation. Okay. Now, a diffusional transformation I would take this, I would break all the bonds, right? and then rearrange the atoms into a different pattern without changing the external shape. So it's like if you have a glass of water and it solidifies, okay, let's assume there's no volume change, then the shape of the glass is the same. Right? Now how does that happen? How does the shape remain the same? And why does the shape, why is it important that the shape remains the same? So that's a question to you. What is the advantage in the shape remaining the same? Yeah, let's assume there's no volume change. Yeah. Absolutely right. So there's no strain to worry about. So it's closer to equilibrium and there's a larger free energy change. Yeah. But it requires diffusion. So imagine that I have this displacive transformation and I take this triangle here okay, and I cut it off and I put it onto this side then I recover this shape right so this is the diffusion and mass transport that you need in order to get a diffusional transformation if you cannot do that mass transport during the time of the experiment then you will not get diffusional transformation but if it's possible, you will not get displacive transformation because a diffusional transformation is closer to equilibrium. Okay. Now, of course, if you have that much mass transport, that means movement of atoms, then supposing that the square atoms prefer to be in the product phase, they will have an opportunity to partition. Yeah. So you can see here, the concentration of square atoms is larger than here, okay, and it's, it's zero in the parent phase. So, the, let's assume these are manganese atoms, yeah. they will tend to partition between the two phases wherever they have a lower free energy. So, that is the difference between a reconstructive and a displacive transformation. And if this is happening in absolutely pure iron, you still would require diffusion of this part to this part to retain the shape. Okay. So 
So in absolutely pure iron, you can get ferrite and you can get martensite. If you cool pure iron rapidly, then it's stuck at this point. If you cool it slowly, then this kind of diffusion is possible and therefore you get ferrite. So experiments have been done for pure iron where you can see the shape change due to martensite formation. You have to cool at approximately 10 to the 5 degrees per second. So it's a very high cooling rate. Pure iron has a very low hardenability. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? That even if it is absolutely pure iron, you can distinguish between martensite and ferrite because martensite will have a shape change like this. Okay, so here are time temperature transformation diagrams and basically what they mean is that if I supercool the austenite to this temperature and then I hold it, then transformation will start at this point. Okay? And I've got two of them. One is for iron 0.4 carbon and iron 0.4 carbon to manganese. And you can divide these TTT curves into two parts. The top C curve okay, represents reconstructive transformations and the lower one displacive transformations. We'll go into that in more detail later. First of all, why are these C curves? Why is a TTT diagram uh, like a, a C curve? That means there's a slow reaction, fast reaction and slow reaction again. Absolutely right. So the diffusion coefficient decreases as you lower the temperature, but the driving force increases as you lower the temperature. So the two balance at high temperatures, you've got a small driving force, but a high diffusion coefficient. At low temperatures, you've got a large driving force, but a small diffusion coefficient. And in between, there's an optimum rate of transformation. <coughs> And th this line defines where martensite forms, and it's uh, in this region, it's insensitive to the cooling rate. Now, I'd like you to explain to me why uh, manganese retards the rate of transformation. So, if I compare the plain carbon steel with the steel containing manganese, then the reaction is slower. Why is that? Okay, yeah, so uh, if manganese is diffusing, then it will retard the reaction because it's a substitutional solute and therefore it diffuses slowly, right? What else? So let's assume there's no, no other phases than ferrite and austenite. Okay. How else can manganese influence? Sorry, say again. Right, right. Um, yeah, the, I mean, I mean that's a complicated interaction, but isn't there a very simple reason? Hmm? No, no. How did you calculate the martensite start temperature as a function of alloying elements? Free energy. Yeah. So some elements will stabilize austenite relative to ferrite, and therefore they would reduce the rate of reaction. Yeah. So it's a thermodynamic effect. You add manganese to iron, then austenite becomes more stable relative to ferrite and therefore the free energy of transformation is reduced and therefore these curves are at longer times than for the plain carbon steel. Okay. 
But remember, this is a logarithmic scale here. So why is this reaction here retarded so much more than this reaction? So bear in mind there are two major factors. One is that if manganese diffuses, then it will slow things down. And the second is the thermodynamic effect. So why are displacive transformations retarded a lot less than reconstructive transformations? Uh, certainly there's uh, more strain energy here but you know this effect is very large so here you're going from one second to ten seconds here you're going from one second to a thousand seconds so just think in terms of the two effects which is diffusion and thermodynamics is there a difference between these two? Yeah, yeah. Go and say it louder. Yeah, so in this case, there's no diffusion of manganese. So that factor doesn't play a role. All that manganese is doing is altering the thermodynamics. In this case, that is not true. The manganese will partition between the parent and product phases and that dramatically slows down the reaction. Okay? So we'll do that in quantitative detail in a later lecture. So uh, think in terms of thermodynamics that anything which reduces the free energy of transformation uh, you regard as an austenite stabilizer and anything which increases the free energy of transformation you regard as a ferrite stabilizer. But it's not always true to say that an element will be an austenite stabilizer at all temperatures. So for example chromium people think about it as a ferrite stabilizer, but it lowers the Martin size start temperature. Okay? So it depends. The best way is to just think in terms of free energy. But austenite stabilizer, ferrite stabilizer is just for talking. Okay? Okay, uh, the, there is more detail in these time temperature transformation diagrams. So if I look at the upper curve, then you have the ferrite yep. at high temperatures, close to A3, and if your composition is suitable, then you also get perlite. And these are both reconstructive transformations. If you take a sample of austenite and you polish it completely flat and form ferrite or perlite, you will not see any change. Okay. And you can find a movie on my YouTube channel. Yeah, which is linked to my web page, which shows nothing happening. Okay? And that's the ferrite forming. And then you'll find other movies showing displacive transformation. But it's interesting to watch also when there's nothing happening to convince yourself that transformation is happening but you don't see any change on the surface. Okay? And those movies are taken using uh, confocal light microscopy, uh, which, which we have here. They are taken in GIFT. Okay. Confocal laser microscopy. Okay, I haven't finished. Yeah, so these, this is ferrite and perlite. Uh, we will see that there are different kinds of displacive transformations as we increase the undercooling, and this temperature usually is of the order of 600 degrees centigrade, below which the diffusion of iron becomes difficult. So, in almost all time temperature transformation diagrams, you'll find these two curves are separated or they cross at approximately 600 degrees centigrade. You get a phase called Wiedmann ferrite, and I'll explain what that is later. As you lower the temperature further, you get upper bainite, and then lower bainite, and then martensite. And whatever theory you have has to explain all of these 
transformation. I thought I discovered the root, but it was just coincidence that I stepped on this wire. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, what is upper bainite? What is lo lower bainite? So, these are basically microstructural classifications which go back to the period when transmission electron microscopy first became possible for iron and tin foils and so on. And I want you to notice uh, several things on these schematic diagrams. First of all, the typical size of a bainite plate is about 10 micrometers in length, but the thickness is about 0 0.2 micrometers. Now, what is the wavelength of light, light in an optical microscope? Sorry? No, no, you need to say it louder because, you know. Don't worry, just take a guess. less than seven micrometers, you said? Yeah, it's actually about half a micrometer, you know, 500 nanometers. Yeah. Uh, so, this is 200 nanometers. So, you're not going to resolve individual plates of bainite in an optical microscope. Yeah. And you're definitely not going to resolve the particles of cementite by an optical microscope. Uh, so, in upper bainite, the plates of ferrite do not contain cementite, but you have precipitation between the plates, and that makes the microstructure quite bad from the point of view of toughness, because these are quite coarse particles of cementite. If you're making a strong steel, then the cementite acts like inclusions and causes uh, poor toughness, okay? compared with tempered martensite where you, you can control the size of the carbides by altering the heat treatment. Okay. Uh, in lower bainite, we have precipitates inside the plates and a smaller amount of precipitation in between the plates because, you know, the total amount of carbon is still the same. You're just transforming at a different temperature. So, if you have precipitation inside the plates, then you will have finer precipitates between the plates. So, lower bainite, even though it is stronger than upper bainite, is tougher because the particles which initiate fracture, you know, cementite, assuming your steel is not dirty and doesn't contain manganese sulfides and all the rest of it, lower bainite stronger but tougher than upper bainite, right? But the scale of the structure is roughly, roughly the same. And this forms at a larger undercooling than upper vein, and that's why it's called upper and lower vein. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, w I will show you that you will see some contrast, but, yeah, yeah, but you will not you, you, you will definitely not be able to see individual platelets. Yep. Okay, so in a transmission electron microscope, that's what upper bainite looks like. All right. So you have the clean plates of ferrite with the residual phases in between the plates. And look at the scale over here. Okay. So this is of the order of 0 0.2 of a micrometer. Remember, sectioning effects. Okay? So just because this looks bigger than 0 0.2 micrometers doesn't mean uh, it's that thick because if you take your book and you section on different planes, you will see. So you have to make a stereological correction for sectioning effects. So in an optical microscope, you would see this as one plate. Yeah? Uh, this is lower bainite. Again, look at the scale here. Yeah. And these are individual platelets. You've got finer cement, uh, cementite 
between the plates and you can see you have precipitates inside the plates as well. Okay. So this is a transmission electron micrograph of lower bainite. No. Yeah. So the question is, is the cementite acting like the transformation twins in martensite? No, because it's a totally different crystal structure. It's autorhombic. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is an optical micrograph of... of <laughs> optical micrograph of bainite in a matrix of martensite. So it's basically partial transformation to bainite and then quench. Now the first thing to notice is that the background is hardly etched, whereas the bainite is etched, right? And why is that? Because there is a lot of structure. You know, you've got the cementite particles and therefore when you attack with etchant, it attacks all the interfaces. Therefore, it etches dark relative to martensite. So it's very easy to distinguish bainite from martensite as long as you have carbon in your material, cementite. Yeah? And the color of this is not uniform. You know, you can see lots and lots of contrast inside. And that's because you're not resolving individual objects. This is also a very special optical micrograph because you are looking at two different surfaces at the same time. Okay, so the image is of two different surfaces. And from that, you can see that this is a plate. Yeah, this is the same object, and you're looking at the depth. Yeah. Okay. So this is a very clever technique, actually, and it's not difficult, but it's, it's forgotten. This is, if you could see this, this is 1969. Yeah. It's called two-surface analysis. And you can do it easily. The uh, difficulty is to preserve a nice edge. Yeah, so when you're grinding, the edge has to be away from the place where the grinding debris is coming. Okay. But it's a beautiful image which demonstrates that this is in the form of a plate. So that immediately gives you a clue about the mechanism of transformation. Why should it form as a plate? No, you see, it seems to be random, okay? <laughs> now, uh, given that the size is 0 0.2 micrometers, you cannot observe the displacements using optical interference microscopy. You know, 0.2 micrometers is much less than the wavelength of light. So, there's another instrument called atomic force microscopy. Have you heard of this? Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard of a record player? Record player for music. Yeah. How does it work? How does a record player work? Yeah, you have a, a record and then you have an arm. How does that produce music? Hmm? No, 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 nothing to do with magnet. Hmm. So you have, in, in the arm of the record player, you have a, a needle, yeah? And it's following a groove which produces the music. Okay. So, of course, you have never seen one of these because you are using your telephones or iPods or whatever, okay? <laughs> but um, I have a record player at home, yeah? and there's a needle which produces the music. Atomic force microscopy works a bit like that, that you've got a, a, a very, very fine needle, and it basically maintains a constant distance from the surface, 
And the way it maintains a constant distance is you get a tunneling current, right? So when you, when you approach something very closely, even though it's not touching, you may get tunneling of electrons. So it monitors that tunneling current and maintains that current constant by having a piezoelectric crystal which moves the needle up or down to follow. Okay? So with that, we can get very high resolution measurements of surface topography. So this is an image where we polished a crystal of austenite completely flat and then allowed it to transform into bainite. And you can see quite spectacular displacements. Right? Look at uh, the scale here. It, in terms of height, is 200 nanometers, and that is one micrometer. So these are individual platelets of bainite. So it's an invariant plane strain deformation, just like margin size. Okay. Exactly like margin size. We can measure the shear strain. It's approximately 0.26. And here you can see these displacements. It's almost like if you have a scratch, then the scratch becomes stepped. Yeah, if you look at the edge over here, that's like a scratch which has been displaced. One more feature which is not there with martensite is this is the adjacent austenite. Can you see that it has relaxed? Yeah. So that is really important. The reason why it has relaxed is because these strains are too large to support at a high temperature where bainite forms. In other words, the austenite undergoes plastic relaxation to reduce the effect of this large displacement. Okay? The austenite is not strong enough to just accommodate the shape change elastically. You will see that this has a major effect on the development of the bainite reaction. Okay. So I will continue with this uh, in the next lecture, but this is really important to know that this isn't exactly like martensite, where the displacement is elastically accommodated. Here, you, the adjacent austenite relaxes plastically, and I will show you later on the consequences of that, because when austenite deforms to relax, of course it introduces lots of dislocations. And if you have a glissile interface, it will be stopped by those dislocations. So it's like a barrier. Anything you do to harden the austenite will stop a displacive transformation. Yeah. So I, I can stop martensitic reaction from happening by severely deforming the austenite. That's called mechanical stabilization. You were talking about it earlier. Yeah? So we'll go into all that in more detail in the next lecture. Okay?